Sangha, respectful representatives of institution and embassies, dear organizers of the committee, dear audience, ladies and gentlemen. It's a very great honor to be here with you today. I never dreamed that I would ever stand in front of a mainly Rukhain audience to talk about Rukhain history in the conditions that we are living today. So, what I'm going to say that as a historian, we shouldn't get involved with passion and emotion. I feel a lot of emotion today uh, and have, and really appreciate you now to be with you. What I'm going to present today within the framework of Rukhain history it's a small chapter of Rakhain history, but it's a very important one. And I never had the chance to talk about that period of history in any lecture that I gave over the last 20 years. I also would like to take the opportunity to reply to the introduction that we have got on the seminar just right now. History is important. The study of history is important. And if non Myanmar, non Rakhine, foreign, foreign historians can contribute to the study of history, I think they should do it. It's always been a pleasure to study Rakhine history, to get involved with the larger context of the Bay of Bengal, of Myanmar history, of Indian history, because it's a matter of investigating things that other people may not yet have discovered and it's always a great enjoyment to share this evidence. And that's what foreign historians, as we are welcome here today, can do and can contribute. And it's particularly important in the current context, political, social, economic context of Myanmar, where we, so, where we see so much change, where we all will also see more than ever all the problems that have been existing in the country that come forward now and that the people of the country, not foreigners, but the people of the country have find ways to solve. So by contributing to historical research, foreign historians may share their experience and they bring forward evidence. It is up to the people to use the evidence, to discuss them, to use the experience of the past, to learn about it, to learn about their own identity. So let me turn to that chapter of history that I would like to present today. Thank you. The Myanmar conquest of Rakhine in 1784-1785. It's an important chapter of Rakhine history because it's a period of dramatic change that happens. The point of historical no return because Rakhine was a kingdom and it became the province of Myanmar under the reign of the Myanmar kings. Rakhine nationalists are particularly looking in a negative way on that period of history. I mean, most in the audience will probably share that feeling and think about it. And if I have chosen to treat about this topic today, it's because I'm talking to those who are the inheritance of that history and the identity that you link, also to the way that we are looking, that we all are looking at this period of history. I think there's a need for a critical historical view, because the picture is actually complex. And let's go back to the essentials of history. The past is what has happened, and history is what has been written about it, and what we eventually could know about it. We always should bear in mind that we do not know everything and we can't know it because the past is not the history. And the memory, what people have chosen from history to remember and to report, eventually to use today as part of their identity, may again be something somewhat different. Identity is a key concept today for people in Myanmar as they are aware that they are living in a country where people have different and openly should be proud of having different identities and sharing different pasts and cultures. 
we should bear in mind that when we are talking about Rakhine history, there will always be a viewpoint from the Rakhine. And there will always be a view from looking at it from outside and, doing, and looking at it within a context that is not limited only to what happened in Rakhine, but we link it up, and that's what my colleague Stefan is going to do, linking it up neighbor regions that put things sometimes in a quite different light. And that, I think, is extremely important. When we are talking about Rakhine history at the end of the 18th century, we are thinking about Rakhine as having going or being about to go through a long period of political and economic decline. Rakhine at the 18th century, that's not the Rakhine of the great period of Mraugu, because it's not the same political and economic powerhouse that it used to be in its golden age in the late 16th and 17th centuries. So talking about the long decline of Rakhine monarchy and receding less and less political role and economic role in the Bay of Bengal made it into a place that was not threatening anymore like it used to be in the 17th century. Now talking about the context, we're looking to the West and we see the British, with the East India Company, taking a strong presence in Bengal, extending its power over the rest of India. We have a rising power in India at that time. In the East, we also have a rising, a newly arising power, the early Kongbaum dynasty that came along with India starting in 1752 as a new king who is reunifying the kingdom of Myanmar, becoming a power that is threatening its neighbors, that is also extending, expanding in different directions. And that's what I'm coming to talk on the next slide. Thank you. I would like in my presentations to be somewhat a bit repetitive. So sometimes you're going to see things that I'm going to say again. The reason is that the way that I look at history is not only that we have to look at things from here, we have to look at things from another point of view, just to get a complex picture, to get closer to the past, and not stick to narrow perspectives. The other idea that I heard about history is like in geology, that you have different levels, different strata of experience, of people, of context, there's the economy, there's the society, there's religion, there's culture, and so they come together. And to gain that point of view, sometimes we have to move. It's like walking around an object to see it from different sides. And that's what I will try to do here. So look a little bit also at what is particular about this context. So definitely the conquest of Rakhine by Myanmar in 1785, it's not in a historical continuity. It's not like Myanmar wanted to conquer Rakhine all the time. No, it's actually, it comes 200 years after the last attempt to take control over Rakhine, it's not been a traditional enemy of Myanmar. Rakhine had never been dominated by Myanmar, like for example, the Mon, Chien. And what we see there, it's not like taking a, a, a revenge for any kind of Rakhine aggression in these times, because Rakhine was actually rather weak and didn't, as I said before, did not threaten anybody. So when we're talking about Rakhine and Myanmar, they always present it as close, as similar, sharing the same Buddhist culture, sharing a similar cultural background, that's important, but they have different histories. As I sometimes say, they don't have the same heroes, they don't really have the same religious roots. When you're looking at the history of Buddhism, for instance, you have to bear in mind that the history of Buddhism in Rakhine is somewhat different from the history historically developed. We're not talking about a teaching, we're not talking about a practice, but historically in which political context it developed. These are things that you need to bear in mind before you start to investigate history. Bear in mind that different places have different historical experiences. It had not the same influence that it underwent during its experience uh, during its historical experience, mainly the one that we know in the early modern period, when we're talking about Mao Kingdom. 
issues. I'd like to quote the royal order. I just paraphrase it. I didn't give a full translation here. The official order of King Bodapaya before the conquest of Rakhine. Please let me tell you from a historian who gets into the sources that we have more detailed information about the conquest of Rakhine from Myanmar sources than about many other conquests or attempts from Myanmar. We have quite detailed information on certain parts of this conquest. And we have the order of King Bodapaya. So what does he say? He's presenting it as the Rakhine having king having not been in humble submission so that it should be conquered so as to put an end to the country's political anarchy and the sad state of the Buddhist institutions. He describes the condition of Buddhism in Rakhine as a parasite in the flesh of an animal and the Myanmar crown prince, his son, was told to make the religion Sasana shine again by arresting the scum of their people who did not abide by the law and were stained on the bottom. So that is not an exceptional, that is the usual way that kings in Myanmar, in Siam, in Laos, in Cambodia were presenting political conquests in religious terms. Because the Dhammaraja king has to oblige by his foremost duty to protect the religion. So conquest is often presented or mostly presented in these religious terms. Next slide. The question is, why did King Bodapaya conquer Rakhine? What was the historical context? What were the motives? I just quoted what's in the order that is in front of the detailed listing of all the troops that were sent to conquer Rakhine. It's kind of the official motive that then we, as historians, try to analyze deeper what could have been the reason, what is the historical context, we recall first that, no, it's not traditional. The last attempt goes back to King Medina of Spain at the end of the 16th century. And generally, Myanmar expansion goes towards the east, goes towards what is now northern Thailand, goes to, towards what is used to be Siam, Ayutthaya, it's going then in the 18th century further south to Tenasserim. It's only something that basically happened in the middle of the 18th century. This takes place at the moment that King Alamitiya has reunified Iwa and Bogu in one single kingdom. And he is going to lead, and that's new, that's something relatively new, expanding also towards the northwest namely towards Manipur. Manipur, who had in the early, early 18th century been a great cause of trouble for the kings of Ewa. This was, you could say, a kind of revenge, but it's the beginning of an expansion towards the northeast that leads us in the reign of King Bajido towards the conquest of Assam as well. So, traditionally controlling the areas east, now, in the late 18th century, we see, and early 19th century, we see expansion going to the west. So Rakhine is one territory that is situated to the west. It's not the only one we have in the northwest. Manipur, Jaintia, Assam, that were also being areas that are kind of newly explored by Myanmar kings in a kind of a need to control these areas. The slow decline of Myanmar domination in areas east of the Sarwin River that I mentioned here at the, in the bottom line, namely Chiang Mai, where the compound kings are losing control. Around 1782, Chiang Mai is going to have a new king, King Kawila. Those of you who know Chiang Mai history probably are aware of that. The last control, Myanmar control, in northern Thailand is Chiang Sai. 1804, presence of Myanmar goes up to 1804 in that area. You see, Rakhine, the conquest of Rakhine, takes its place as kind of an area of new expansion towards the west, while the importance of Myanmar political power in northern Thailand is constantly declining, namely also then in the, on the upper Mekong area, Chengsen is on the Mekong, as you probably know, 
while at the same time we have the southeast expansion that leads to attacks against Phuket, which we know obviously as a high island today, but that was an area around in the first decade of the 19th century where Myanmar Navy uh, was going to try to extend its uh, control. Why did King Bonapia come from? What kind? What are motives of the conquest? Now, when we try to analyze this and to make it in a systematical presentation, looking at political and ideological motives, we just refer to it that Rakhine was in political anarchy. Around 1785, when Myanmar attacked Rakhine, Rakhine was divided among seven different little kings and lords. That's what you call political anarchy because there is no central power and there was no more central power. So that was a way of re-establishing peace. I put it here uh, with hyphens because it's a divided area. King Bodhapaya was extremely self-conscious in his Buddhist identity. He saw that re-establishing political order, what Rukhain is with, it's conquering and putting an end to their monarchy, is kind of fulfilling the idea of being a true Buddhist king. Reforming the sadhana, that was matching the sadhana and the conditions of the monk in Rakhine with those that he wanted to enforce in Myanmar. And those of you who know Myanmar history, they also know how much King Bodhapaya's reign has been contested and also negatively viewed in Myanmar history. That's not everything bad about King Bodhapaya, by the way, and that's also when we try to present a chapter of history like this, we should look at how did the king himself view what he was doing, his political action. Not just fixed to the way that later generations were looking at the king. And then we also have to say that being weak, it was an easy prey. It was an easy conquest. And it allowed King Bodhapaya to demonstrate how great a king he was. I will probably surprise you by telling you today that among the religious motives, I also consider a very high regard of King Bodhapaya for Rakhine past, history, tradition, and Buddhism. When King Bodhapaya took away Mahamuni's statue from Rakhine, it is because of the highest regard that he had for the statue. It's a loss for Rakhine, but for him, it was a tremendous, of tremendous importance. And it was linked in his mind to a very high regard that he had for the Rakhine past as being a truly Buddhist country. There may also, but we have barely any sources on this, economic motives. Because what we see after the conquest of Rakhine is that Myanmar tries to develop the trade with Bengal by crossing by constructing roads over Rukhine Yuma. Now, let's get a little bit to the military uh, facts of the conquest. As you see on this map, and on the few uh, explanations that I give here, and I take this from the royal order that explains the conquest, basically the strategy was, the strategy, the strategy was, uh, to let the troops move down south, get on the boats, and conquer Rakhine, moving up from the south. Uh, in the detailed presentation, how the troops should march, we have then the land route, and there are three of them, the maritime road. Uh, what's in the Kongmangse presented as Uyangu Road, I think it was the road by Tongo. Near the Yenpete Road, I identify the road that goes through on the Rokhang side, huh? and on the Myanmar side, it's Mepe, or Mepe, and uh, the Telet and the Ain Road, and it is slightly towards the north. On this side, you cannot see it very well, but on another slide, you know, it will be possible to identify these two locations. And then the third one is Myanmar Road by the Ye, further north. Altogether, about 20,000 men. That's the number of the royal order. I think it's the historical correct number in the compound say you're going to find 33,000, which I, I think is not correct number. Next slide, please. 
just to fly one time over the whole period of 40 years from 1785 to 1825. I just would like to fly one time with a number of key events for all those of you who have ever gone into looking at the period, you know, just, and it may be for you, for most who are kind, people interested in history, a way of maybe having some idea about questions later on that we could get into some more details, because I think there are some chapters that are really bad in uh, 1784, that's at the end of the year, Myanmar troops getting ready, then moving down south, and uh, relatively easy conquering the south, and we now moving up to long breath. That's even a place where at the end of the 17th century Myanmar troops could advance, taking advantage of fast, fastly advancing. Was there no res resistance from Rakhine? There was, but most military resistance was localized, reduced to some pockets of resistance. So that Myanmar troops advanced relatively fast, and the 1st January 1785, Myanmar Grand Prince enters Rauru. I recall that at that time there were seven different laws who had kind of divided the rule of Rakhine among the South. There was no unity. 22nd January, the date where Mamuni's statue would have been put upon the raft and taken away to Marabara. In 1786, here I give just like, it's just like a few spots, you know, uh, for, for, for seeing a little bit uh, what were key events in the chronology. In 1786, for the first time, we see Rakhine fleeing to the Chittagong area in small numbers. And it took about two years later that the, the order came from the king to bring all the court of Rakhine to Hamarako. What was the reason for that? Obviously, because we didn't want resistance coming from that side. And I'll be coming back to that point. Problems arise with the British authorities in Chittagong already about 1787, for the first time that we hear about rebel activities. In 1789, for the first time, we have military conscription uh, in Rakhine, that Rakhine men are joining the war against Chiang Mai. You see, it's a time that Myanmar tries to regain control of Northern Thailand, in which they're going to fail. 1791-93, I mentioned that here there's a succession of four Myanmar governors, and we wonder about administrative problems. So what do we see here in the first years is when Myanmar conquers Rakhine in the first moment, it remained relatively quiet. Local resistance is relatively fast to disappear and problems start only after several years. Sometimes there's an idea that there was like all the time war, which is not the case. It took some years for Myanmar control to prevail in Rakhine before any kind of serious problems would start. But one of the first rebel leaders, I don't know if it is familiar to you, who had fled to the British territories, was surrendered by the British authorities. One major aspect of this period is obviously what, were, what was the East India Company doing when all these events took place? Basically, the British knew nothing about Myanmar and they knew of, uh, even less about Rakhine for a very long time. We see that during the first Anglo-Myanmar war, when they had no information about the country that they were about to come back. And in the first time, they said like, oh, that's a rebel. We want a peace with the neighbor king. We want to keep peace with Myanmar. So they surrendered this rebel. Later on, they're going to take a different stance when it comes to somebody who most of you will know more, who was the most famous of these rebels and who caused a lot of trouble. Then at the end of the 90s, we have a massive movement of people who are leaving Rakhine. We're coming back to that. And the British will try to settle them. That's the name of Hiram Cox, who is the founder of Cox Bazaar, when the British tried to settle all this population. This is in the population census in Myanmar, we're coming back to that. The results have been overstated. I'm coming back to that point as well. We have then 1811-12 Chimia's campaigns in Rakhine. We have later on the, the, the defeat of these rebels, and it's towards the years after King Bonapaya passed away that we get a more quiet period of time in Rakhine, 
where there's a kind of a settlement, an establishment of Myanmar rule in Rakhine. Now, talking about Myanmar administration in Rakhine, I just would like to uh, recall some of the basics. The administrative divisions, the Myo, the Nyawati, Baramwati, Megawati, Ramawati, match with what were later districts under the British. And move on to the next slide, please. Myanmar administration depended obviously on local support. And for all doing this task, like perception of the taxes, of taxes on fishing, of the taxes that the mountain people were paying, you needed all these local men to support uh, the administration. Some prominent figures I mentioned here, who were those also who were involved to have appealed to Myanmar King to invade Rakhine in the first place. Myanmar rule in Rakhine, when we look at it from an analytical point of view, we can look at what it was during the first period in terms of conquest and pacification, of establishing the new administration in Rakhine. We can look at it from the way that Myanmar tried to integrate it from an administrative point of view, with inquiries, with censors, collecting information about the local administration as it was before, Actually, Myanmar administrators did not change very much at local administration, at the village level. We can look at how a census, where they reported the population far too high, leads to problems, problems with tax overburden that the people feel like they have to pay too much taxes. Forced labor of people who were conscripted and taken to Myanmar or even recruited for war campaigns, which actually, and sometimes the kind historians are missing that point, the kind men were only called up when there were not enough Myanmar to go to war. It comes relatively late. When it was difficult in northern Myanmar to recruit men, they called up Rakhine. When there was not enough rice, they asked Rakhine to provide this. And this is definitely one of the reasons that provoked this strong reaction of people just packing up and moving away and moving to Southeast Bengal and provoking this revolt that we see in this chimney. Now when we are looking at the policy of integration of Rakhine, what the Myanmar king did is not only suppressing the monarchy but suppressing the supporting infrastructure. It was not only the king that was King Kamada, who was taken to Amarapura, but all those who could eventually have the claim on the kingship were deported. Most importantly, the Pona and all their supporting staff, probably about 500 people. And here we see one aspect that in a way you can say it's a positive aspect, recognition of something that come, of people that come from Rakhine because the Rakhine Pona become the top elite of ritual and ceremonial specialists at the Kondong court. We have only information about Pona at the court that came from Rakhine over the rest of the 19th century. And that showed a very high regard. The leader of the Muslims at that time, a name that is in one quarter is Abisha Husseini, he was promoted by Bodopiya to become the head of all the Myanmar Muslims, for example. And there were also, and that's also one aspect that most people are not aware of, there were many thousands of Myanmar who moved to Rakhine at that time. So what was the reason for Myanmar to move to Rakhine at that time? Well, one reason was to escape taxes. Because when they came to Rakhine, they were not registered, and they didn't pay taxes. Because King Bodapaya had a lot of trouble to make the Myanmar in Rakhine pay taxes. And they, they were very conscientious to try to control this migratory people who moved into Rakhine at that time. Administration may also have been reorganized at that time. I would also like to point out that many of the monks, the educated monks, were also deported. Please. Now, one particular point is regarding the history of Buddhism uh, in in China. Still, to say a few words of what I consider as a very important chapter, the religious integration uh, of Rakhine, in the way that King Bodhapaya enforces his reforms 
that he is well known about in Myanmar history. And I said at the beginning, history of Buddhism in Rakhine is particular and somewhat different than in Myanmar. It's linked to the early identity in the Wethali period. The problem is that for the Gan period, we know so little about Rakhine history, but we must suspect that there were important things between Rakhine and Pagan at that time, and, and probably also towards Bengal, which was Buddhist at that time, Buddhist and Hindu identity. Buddhism during the Rahu period is obviously not always very well known. We know about the context with Sri Lanka exchange. We know about monastic exchanges with Pagu and Iwa. When we look at Buddhist art in Rakhine, we see this influence from the Myanmar. We see also similar debates by the monks, among the monks that are called Ranyawati and the Marwati monks, competing for the favor of the king. And after 1785, Kibodapaya, sending his Dadana Pew missions to Rakhine, also reflects his interest in Rakhine. The Nyawadi Ayidopong is a text that all of you know as an important historical document. It was compiled by a Myanmar monk sent to Rakhine to study that chapter of history. It's a lot of Ma Pinyajo Shouto that are collected here in this document. It's the first evidence that we have on history. Presented like a hero also by British colonial historians, but when you are quoting text, you see that's very ambiguous. He looks rather like a very self-interested person who rather also for his own interest. And that's why what leads me to say that patriots may rebel, but rebels are not always patriots. Here's the next one. When you are reading G.E. Harvey, when he's talking about Jimya, he's talking a kind of praising words uh, about him when he says, for example, for 17 years, he had led his people gallantly, the most famous of all insurgents, but he never had a chance. He could, he could rely on the other leaders for nothing safe to fail him out of jealousy at a critical moment. It's like kind of a historical appreciation of a hero. But look at what British sources say at that time, please. Lord Minto in 1812 was talking about Jimya, saying, a great and serious injury had been sustained for many years by the state of Awa from the lawless conduct of the Muck refugees, enjoying the protection of the British government. A horde of desperate barbarians infuriated by the recollection of past injuries, talking about the conquest of Rakhine, obviously, inflamed by the desire of conquest and plunder, had committed every species of atrocity, cruelty, and oppression in the province of an ally. And later in a book, Captain White was talking about increasing warfare, forming themselves into band of robbers and living by plunder, and mostly criticizing that Chiambre was very rude and horrible towards the Rakhine, in Rakhine themselves when he invaded the area. Why do I show you these quotations? Because it shows you that how much we have to study the sources and compare them, how much we have to aware of contrasting opinions, it's easy to quote G.E. Harvey. It's easy to go back uh, to all these very uh, easy to ac easy accessible books. But maybe it may be more complicated when we look at the older sources. Next slide, please. So here are just a few pictures from South East Bangalore. Talking about Rakhine's population, um, I'd rather leave than that slide because we need to conclude here. <laughs> I'd rather leave that maybe to some question on Rakhine's kind of population and come back to it. Uh, okay, let me conclude here. I sort of slide overstress the time that I was allotted to. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, I'm very glad to take this uh, question here. Um, <coughs> The question is if uh, I know about the uh, Pagan period uh, conquest of Rakhine. Uh, did, was there a conquest of Rakhine all the way?